Yes, it's the MOJ Show. Please welcome Monica Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the MOJ Show as we continue uh, to dive into uh, this COVID-19 epidemic. Of course, you know, we've seen an uptick in uh, COVID cases. And I've been telling you that I wanted to talk to a specific doctor about um, this pandemic, how it's affecting us, what's going on in the uh, healthcare community. He has an up close and personal look and I'm so happy to have him here on the show. His name is Dr. N. Stewart Harris and Dr. Harris is the chief of the division of wilderness medicine in the department of emergency medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. So yes, he's fancy. <laughs> Dr. Harris, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I can promise you my kids don't find me fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, first of all, thank you so much for joining me um, today. I'm so excited about this. And I want to just let our viewers know that I asked, uh, invited Dr. Harris here on the show because he wrote an article in a magazine called The Commonwealth. And The Commonwealth, if you don't already know, is a uh, nonprofit journal of politics, ideas, and civic life. And with Dr. Harris's uh, experience, he's been all over the world. Uh, he'll explain to you what wilderness medicine is, how it works, and how it has taken him all over the world to get a better understanding of, of certain elements of, of our lives. Um, but he titled this article, Science Isn't Liberal or Conservative, Red or Blue. Dr. Bright, Dr. Rick Bright, personified that view, should be reinstated. Now, uh, Dr. Harris, I want you to explain to us, first of all, what compelled you to write this article? Um, and you were very open, you were very honest about it, and then explain your relationship with Dr. Rick Bright, who he is and what he has done for our country. Thank you, Monica. It's, um, it was driven largely by my concerns about what I saw as a misunderstanding about what science is and the mm -hmm. value it poses to any citizen in our country and our, on our planet. Um, so Dr. Bright leads a group of the federal government or led a group of the federal government that was in charge of uh, anticipating and responding to really, really scary things like mm -hmm. pandemics. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to meet him just last fall in on a completely separate project looking at antimicrobial resistance. So just how bugs uh, that we used to be able to treat very easily with antibiotics, uh, now oftentimes we can't. And that's mm -hmm. a real and, and scary problem. And it's something his group has been thinking about. And so we came to him with an idea less common than not. And so it wasn't just another antibiotic. We need to think about antimicrobial resistance and a, a lot of things in human health on ecological terms. That we're, mm -hmm. we're part of a much bigger whole. You can't just, you know, stick your finger in the eye of evolution, which is essentially what an antibiotic does, mm. um, and, and think you're going to win. We need to be thinking about smart ways that we can work with a larger system. That's an interesting analogy. You can't stick your finger in the eye of evolution. evolution. Wow. Bad, okay. bad, bad things happen. Um, okay. And I think it's uh, his ability to very quickly to – to ask really pointed questions. And he was mm -hmm. skeptical and suspicious. And it's like, no, this isn't the way most people are approaching it. I, I, you know, bam, 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 went through a number of questions. He's like, hey, you know, this could actually, this could work. Okay. And he very quickly went to, rather than just saying so much of the, the narrative around government employees can sometimes be, oh, you know, they're bureaucrats and they're just mm -hmm. sitting around and they're not really thinking. And it's much easier to say no. Um, he was just completely the opposite of that in that he was expert, he listened, and where he could have very easily said, you know, what you're talking about, Stuart, is not something that most people are talking about, and I don't want to listen to it. Um, he said, hey, this could actually work, and we need to investigate it. And so I was just very impressed with uh, his approach and his team and just his professionalism, his willingness yeah. to work hard. Um, and as an American citizen, a taxpayer, I was like, holy cow, to have this guy, you know, leading the charge when then we got into the pandemic, I was like, this is great because he yeah. is exactly who, you know, if you 
looking for a good doctor or for any other professional in your life. You want somebody who who calls them as they see them mm-hmm. and it is professional and is thoughtful. And that was exactly what he was. Yeah. And just to bring everybody up to speed, you guys know this already. Dr. Rick Bright, he is the former head of the federal government's Biomedical and Advanced Research Development Authority. He was fired by the Trump administration for speaking out. And that was, I think, the catalyst, uh, Dr. Harris, that uh, um, compelled you to take pen to paper and start writing. Um, Tell me about that experience, because you wrote you, you speak very highly of him, and you also express the dangers of firing him. Talk about that for me. I mean, I think about that, you know, if I'm at the end of the piece, I talk about a pilot when I'm sometimes working in remote areas in Alaska, a pilot mm-hmm. who's very, very good at what he does, and flying in Alaska is extraordinarily dangerous. And yeah. the, the ability to have a professional who just, who you trust completely Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they're not driven by politics. They're not driven by, you know, media sound bites. It's just like they're doing their job to the best of their ability. Um, th- that's an extraordinary uh, kind of grace of the United States and of other um, functioning uh, democracies that we have, you know, sure. people who just or who dedicate their lives to uh, making things better. And it can be in the service of health, it can be in the service of space exploration, um, you know, all these different ways that I think sometimes a narrative of, you know, big government employee yeah. and somebody sitting around, it's like, well, no, these are people who, um, if we're doing our job well as a nation, we would be mm-hmm. so proud to have them. Um, and so I, I think that was that and the, the narrative that, seems to be ongoing still and that seems to be going on in multiple other ways Mm -hmm. of we're just so polarized and so willing to uh throw aside that we disagree with under the bus rather than having a little humility and Mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that hey man things are maybe a little more complex and maybe you know we all bear some responsibility in a way that we had maybe not previously recognized yeah yeah, I, I was taken aback, to be honest with you, um, that a doctor like you would write an article, because usually you don't hear about medical professions, professionals rather, getting into the politics of it. But for you, it wasn't about politics. It's, it's about keeping the guy who knows what he's doing, like you said, who can steer this ship in the right direction. Um, and one of the things you say in the article is, Science's strength is that it builds safeguards into our clinical trials to protect both subjects and scientists. And I kind of get the feeling that that's what you were saying that Dr. Bright was doing when he sounded the alarm, so to speak. I think it is. I think in midway through the article, I think one of the things I touched on was that science, it's there for all of us. It doesn't care Mm -hmm. whether we're red state or blue state or whatever your politics are. And the whole process is set up so that it's uh, it removes the scientist, it removes the human from the, the data as yeah. much as possible. Just we we all want the world to be as we think it is, and kind of the the great strength of science is that it builds in different levels of uh, of removing individual subjective. Uh, thought and it just tells us what the world is. It doesn't tell us what we should do with that data, right. but it's one of the few ways as humans we have of actually figuring out this is what is actually going on in the physical world. And then what do we do with it? That that's a very different conversation. That's not yeah. scientist's job. Um, and, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I was just going to say again, I was really taken aback by your article. It was very compelling. Um, This one part of this article, here it is right here. You tell this story, you say, there was the death of the World War II veteran who was able to tell me about his service in Europe and how he wanted, quote, comfort measures only before he then died alone, but for the nurse holding his hand. And again, I think that beckons back to your... um, your compliments about Dr. Bright and how very important his role was and would have been in steering this ship and for this World War II veteran. Describe that moment for me 
that you perhaps witnessed? What was that like? It's, uh, unfortunately, it's not u- unique. It, it's happened again and again. Just, mm-hmm. uh, I think, the, the one of the worst aspects of this disease, and I've seen it play out way too many times, is just the separation of uh, patients from their loved ones, um, and sometimes as they're dying. And just the human toll it, it takes, um, and, and it allows us to practice much less good medicine than we should be practicing and that we typically practice. Um, but his uh, comfort and willingness to say, you know, he was very clear and lucid and human and telling great stories um, and, and was ready to go. And I think just his uh, courage and frankly, our sometimes doctors are really bad about saying, oh, I shouldn't you know, be do, doing everything I can do rather than everything I should do. Um, And listening to him and allowing him uh, to pass as he saw fit, you know, I think if we do our job well, that's, you know, you're being driven purely by what the patient uh, thinks is in their interest and and trying to accommodate them however we can. But there have been a lot more people um, just suffering alone, both outside the hospital and inside the hospital, than I think we're fully aware of. And I think that just the sheer tonnage of uh, suffering and anxiety and loneliness um, that are clamping down because of the disease has caused, it's something we're still, I don't think we're accounting for as well as we should. Yeah. You know, um, Dr. Harris, I, I, I do not envy you, especially at this time in our country and in our world. You have to balance, I think, um, two things, and that is doing your job and bringing the compassion that people need um, and are quite literally dying for right now with COVID. Um, The latest numbers with uh, the coronavirus, excuse me, and you know, as a result of the the protest with regard to the death of George Floyd um, and all of the other gatherings as a result of his death, you know, people talking, the police community getting together with with local officials and with community leaders. Um, And I'm sure you've been watching as a healthcare specialist, you know that a lot of people weren't wearing masks. They were not social distancing. And then I heard a lot of people say, you know what, it's it's either we're going to die from racism or we're going to die from this virus. You got to pick your poison, so to speak. The numbers right now, According to Johns Hopkins, um, globally, we have 7,550,933 cases, deaths, 422,136, and in the U.S., 2,026,073, and um, deaths, 113,883. Numbers are spiking all over the place and yet people are still gathering. And I know for people like you, you're in the emergency room, you're seeing this every single day. What do these numbers say to you? And how do you, I don't know, for, for lack of a better way to ask, how do you connect the two? What, why would someone risk this? And is it worth it to risk going out and protesting? And a lot of people say, yeah, absolutely. But in, in your mind, how do we balance this? Because you already know people are still going to die. There's an uptick going on in at least 22 states, 20 or 22 states. How, how do we balance this? I think it's an extraordinarily difficult question you've asked, Monica. And I, I try yeah. to come at it with, um, you know, I, I just don't want people to be sick and showing up needlessly in the emergency department or at mm-hmm. a hospital. Um, So the reasons for getting out and the reasons for feeling like you have to get out and do something, I I get that completely. And I I don't think that that's, um, I think it's an earned (laughs) um, need to to get out and to protest Mm -hmm. and to make changes. Um, But I I just hate to see people putting themselves and others at risk um, in doing so. So Mm -hmm. trying to figure out that, 
And I think it's partially, it's an individual decision that, yeah. you know, what, what are your comfort levels um, with doing things? But if we can try to be as effective as possible in creating change while minimizing our, our risk yeah. um, as individuals. And, um, and I think sometimes, especially if you're surrounded with people who are at higher risk, yeah. Then being, you know, that much more thoughtful is um, that that's something as a physician, I would just ask people to, to be aware of. I'm trying mm-hmm. to in the job of relieving suffering. So if we yeah. can, you know, keep it from happening, that's so much the better. But yeah. um, but these are complex, extraordinarily painful times. And I understand why people are doing what they're doing. Yeah. And, my heart and, and one of the things that that has come up, you know, news and, and chat rooms and all this kind of stuff. And and forgive me if I get emotional. I've just been trying to hold it together during this very rough time in this country because racism is at issue. And what a lot of people are realizing is that racism is directly connected to mental health, physical health, psychological health, you know, and we're all being faced with all of our countries. Um, horrific history. And it's very difficult to process for a lot of people. But you know, again, better than most, that black and brown communities are plagued with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And a lot of experts have been saying that all of that can be correlated with how you're treated, i.e. racism in this country. In your profession, and as of late, the numbers, the hot spots, uh, with regard to COVID-19 have been in places and cities where mostly black and brown people live. My hometown of Detroit, um, you know, New York, you know that, Massachusetts, you guys have had upticks there. Talk about the correlation between the two, doctor. I mean, there's just a tremendous overrepresentation of black and brown communities um, in, in people who are getting sick and especially who are dying of yeah. COVID disease. And it's, um, there are just, I think, too many different ways that it plays into it in ways that I think we're just still completely unaware of or unwillingness, we have an unwillingness to recognize the, yeah. the profoundly uh, different circumstances that each of us face. Um, And I think a lot of it is just, it's purely a structural thing. So it's things that are just baked in so far into our history that we're not even aware of it. And I think that's what's dangerous. And I think if we can gather just the humility as, um, especially as a white person and as Mm -hmm. a white male and as um, there are just so many different ways that even before the the founding documents were written, that the American enterprise is based on having structural ways to make black and brown people uh, less recognized than white people. And it's, um, and I I think it's just, it's a, it's a hard time. And I think for, you know, if you're, white and not feeling badly right now, something's not right. Um, And I think we need to get to the point that, um, I'll be honest, I I was terribly concerned about speaking on the topic with you, Monica, not because I don't trust you hugely and admire you, um, but we've just gotten so quick to, uh, to dismiss people in a way that, and as we've talked about in the past, it's just, we need more, more love and more, um, willingness to look inside each one of us. Right. Um, it's very easy to say, well, you, you over there, you should have done X, Y, or Z where I think, especially, um, it's just that, that willingness to say, I think we all like to think of ourselves as good people and the vast majority of us are. Yeah. But if you're existing in a system that, gives you advantages, even if you're completely unaware of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you're existing in that world, then you need to be thinking and you need to be um, considering and, um, and, and, 
feeling uncomfortable. I think it's it's time that you know time to have the conversation. Yes, ma'am. And I I, that that's why I'm here. Just because uh, if people who think of themselves as good and decent and recognizing there's a problem, if we can't have conversations like we're having, we're lost. Yeah. And I think that that's why I'm here. Yeah. Doc, I want you to stick uh, stick with me for a minute. We have to take a commercial break and we're going to come right back. I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into your article uh, because, again, it was so very compelling to me. I got to tell you, uh, I usually print stuff off and then toss it after the interview. Um, this this printout that I have of your, of your article is all crumpled up because I haven't tossed it. <laughs> so, uh, folks, stick around. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be right back with Dr. N. Stewart Harris. His title is way too long for me to keep repeating. <laughs> so stay tuned. I'll tell you about it when we come back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the MOJ Show. I am so happy to be joined with uh, my very special guest. His name is Dr. N. Stewart Harris. He is the chief of the Division of Wilderness Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he's also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. Doc, before we dive back into our discussion, what is wilderness medicine? I forgot to ask you that at the very top. So <laughs> thank you for the question, Monica. <laughs> it, it, it's essentially, I use two descriptors. So one is resource limited medicine uh-huh. and under austere conditions. So the resource limited part of it is you may not have the, the labs, the CAT scan, the lights um, that you have in a normal medical encounter in uh-huh. the United States. And resource limited is it, things that we completely take for granted in a hospital so that you have you know, heat or air conditioning that you can turn on, that you have mm-hmm. clean running water, that you have uh, the ability to, to flush a toilet. These are all things that in a large part of the world are not the case. And so it's trying to figure out ways that we can treat people who aren't as privileged as we are in the United States. Oh, wow. So, okay. That's impressive. That's I, that's why I wanted you to explain it to our audience. Because when I heard wilderness medicine, I'm like, oh, what, he treats animals? That's interesting. <laughs> In addition to treat animals, human animals, <laughs> human animals, right? <laughs> and and folks, just to give you, uh, just I'll give you a couple uh, nuggets here. Like I said, this doctor is remarkable. I'm so excited to have him. I've I've interviewed uh, the doctor who uh, discovered uh, the uh, concussion uh, in in NFL players. Um, also, Dr. Oz, and now Dr. N. Stewart Harris. So I'm good. If I never interview another doctor, I'm good because <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about this. But Dr. Harris uh, has done research with the Himalayan Rescue Association in Mar- Mount Everest. Uh, Ryan, did I say that right? Um, research with the Army's Research Institute for Environmental Medicine since 2004. And he's been with the uh, research teams. Uh, who are active in the Andes Mountains for East Siberia and Alaska. Told you, he's fancy. So I'm so glad I have him here on the MOJ show. So uh, once again, folks, we're talking about an article that Dr. Harris wrote in the uh, Commonwealth. It's a nonprofit journal of politics, ideas, and civic life. And the title is Science is it Liberal or Conservative, Red or Blue. And uh, he basically is or has responded to Uh, the termination of Dr. Rick Bright from the Trump administration. Dr. Bright, he's the former head of the federal government's Biomedical and Advanced Research uh, Development Authority, also known as BARDA. So Dr. Harris here had worked with him, and once he learned of his termination, he was compelled to write this article. And again, you have over 25 years of uh, experience in your field, my gosh, Um, And you've seen a lot. And one of the things, doctor, that um, I told you this really uh, compelled me to reach out to you was one, our mutual friend, Mickey Hyman. Thank you so much, Mickey. I love you. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, This is this is extraordinary. Um, But it's that human side of you. 
which I don't see in a lot of doctors. And I've interviewed a lot of doctors in my career. One of the things that you encountered or one of the persons that you encountered um, who passed away in your emergency room, and I'll try to read this without tearing up, but you had an experience. And what I was surprised about was that you recounted that experience in spite of the fact that you see this kind of thing every day in the emergency room. So folks, listen to this. He says, the previously healthy mother in her mid forties, she had been walking around her house the night before and less than 24 hours later, her heart after every technology and hope had been exhausted, simply quit pumping as the virus reduced it to a quivering standstill. It's hard to recover from something like that when you're reading it because as a mom, I envisioned it. And then I envisioned you all having to sit there and watch this happen. Describe that moment to me, Dr. Harris, and what happened leading up to and then after the fact. Well, this is one of the awful things. And we're still, there's so much we don't know, but this was in a time when we knew even less. And we were just finding out, we originally thought it was predominantly the lungs that were affected. And we were slowly figuring out that, wait a second, there are multiple other organ systems that are sometimes affected. And it's very rare, but we're definitely seeing cases where like this woman, she had almost no symptoms other than heart related and went from being fully functional, healthy, uh, you know, mid 40 year old to being dead of the virus mm -hmm. um, 24 hours later. And I'm extraordinarily privileged at Mass General just in that we've got a deep bench and we've developed a lot of technologies that are used around the nation and world and have you know an extraordinary group of colleagues that I can call on as people get progressively sick. But even <laughs> utilizing all of that, um, we weren't able to save her. And you know that happens sometimes. But I think in the face of uh, so many people similarly uh, suffering, and again the separation of loved ones from their family. Yeah. Typically, we would have had the family in the room under those circumstances. I think it's extraordinarily difficult, but extraordinarily important for people to be connected, especially at times like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so after she had died, I felt, and I've talked about this with a number of other colleagues, just transfixed, like, to leave her side um, before her family could get there mm -hmm. um, would be a dereliction uh, that I, I wouldn't have done my job. And that's has nothing to do with medical care at some level. Um, but it, it's just, and I, again, I've seen this throughout the hospital and all different levels, but just the ways that um, we've tried to be respectful of you know, the human being, it's a pandemic, it's affecting so many people. But at the end of the day, if we're any good at our job, um, and that's kind of the thrust of wilderness medicine is mm -hmm. we're trying to recognize that any quality medical encounter has to be between a ape care provider and a human being. So that, that it's that human connection that mm -hmm. I think it's very easy in a modern hospital to, you know, put a computer between you and the patient and yeah. start typing your note and you're not making eye contact. And, um, and so trying to be driven by that sense of, you know, th this is, we've been doing this for 2,400 years, mm -hmm. um, at least in Western medicine and probably longer than that in other traditions. But that, that sense that, Medical care has to begin with two human beings sitting down and talking um, is really what is kind of my end, end goal. I, I try to uh, keep humanism in medicine um, kind of through that and storytelling in other ways. Um, and I think it just it helps uh, provide better care, more efficient care, more kind care. Um, so in this case, it was just a matter of holding her hand and being there at the bedside while we waited her family and to have that handoff. Um, I couldn't imagine the family walking in, you know, to find their mother uh, unattended. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, 
I'm being very inarticulate, but it's, uh, I think, something that we have to take seriously, that it's, it's not about little viruses or all the fancy equipment that we can throw at people. It's, it's human beings um, that, that ultimately make for good medical care. Dr. Harris, how has COVID-19 and everything you've experienced in the emergency room, outside of the emergency room, the race issue playing into this? Because it is playing into it as much as people like to dance around the issue. Um, I've decided that I am the mother of a young black male child. I can't dance around it. It would be irresponsible for me to do so. But how has it changed you as a doctor, as a husband, as a father, um, as a human being, because surely this is something you can't shake. You're on the front lines. Um, I hope it's made me uh, a little kinder, a little more aware, uh, a little more willing to be uh, modest and to, uh, I'm saying I don't know a lot more than I ever have in my life. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, having the confidence to say, you know, there are things we don't know, but there are ways that we do know how to figure it out. And so yeah. our research with the inhaled nitric oxide, looking to treat the disease, uh, again, I have an extraordinary group of colleagues in anesthesia um, with a deep expertise in nitric oxide that, you know, we've been able to step up a study in the midst of kind of the world falling down around us and so that human and institutional capacity to say, yeah, things look grim, but there are ways that we can work to make things better and to try to figure yeah. them out. Um, I'm very proud of Mass General and uh, of medicine in general, uh, that even as we're trying to take care of people, the best way we can take care of people is to keep them well or to treat yeah. them early. So thinking about ways that we can use our tools um, I know I've joked with you in the past, it's much better to have a seatbelt than it is a good trauma yeah, center. Yeah, I like um, that analogy. <laughs> so if we, can, <laughs> if we yeah. can try to keep people from getting sick, you know, that is so much That's better. the key. That's the key. Doc, I have to take another uh, commercial break. Stay with me. Um, we got a lot more to talk about. This is interesting stuff, good information. Uh, folks, uh, we'll be right back. We got to take a quick commercial break. It's the MOJ Show with Dr. N. Stewart-Harris talking about COVID-19. 19 and all of the elements that have played into this pandemic plaguing our world right now. We'll be right back. Congratulations to New Orleans. 42 years of age, emergency support goaltender. Get it out, Kerfoot. I'm in. What a save! We know, we know, we to absolutely nobody. What a scene here, opening day. I am pumped. And I got goosebumps right now. P-A-L-A-M-A. -A Correct. It's unbelievable. Go, 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 go. everybody. Welcome back to the MOJ Show. We are having a great conversation uh, regarding COVID-19. My guest today is Dr. N. Stuart Harris. He is a very, very, very fancy doctor. I have to look at my notes every time I introduce him because I can't remember his long title. He is the chief of the Division of Wilderness Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. So, Doc, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I know you have a huge busy schedule, so we really appreciate you being here. You know, before we went to commercial break, I asked you, how has this experience with COVID-19 changed you in your emergency room as a family man uh, and as a human being? And um, I think what, what you were saying, just to sum it up, is that we all have to get back to basics, that human touch, that human experience. I think you're right. And it, it frankly, it made me a little sad, Monica, when you were just saying that doctors don't uh, 
don't leap to mind when you think about human. Yeah, that compassion. I, that's why I told you, you know, it's very interesting to me. You, For you, it seems just based on our conversation, it seems to come very natural. But believe me when I tell you, it does not come natural to a lot of healthcare professionals. And it's very sad, especially when you have a lot of people who count on people in your community um, to lead them through their health care uh, protocols, you know, as they get older. And I've seen that happen a lot of times. I used to be afraid to speak up when it comes to uh, health care and my doctor, because I thought, well, they're the expert. But now I'm not. I'm like, no, I have questions. And if you are not capable or unwilling, you know, to, to hang in there with me and let me answer the question so that I have some sort of control over my health, then I'm going to switch doctors. And I've had to do that before. So you're very unique in that aspect, and, and I suspect in other aspects of your profession. So, you know, bravo to you. And I'm not, I'm not just blowing smoke. I'm, I'm being very honest. Like I said, I've interviewed a lot of doctors in my career, and not all of them are in Stuart Harris. <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. Doctor, okay, I want to move into um, a deeper uh, conversation about COVID-19. I rattled off some numbers to you um, as of late, as of today, um, the numbers globally over 7 million. Uh, deaths, uh, we're getting close to about 450,000 uh, globally. Here in the United States, we have over 2 million now and um, over 100,000 deaths. Let's talk about the protocols. As the states are opening up, that's what's happening right now. States are opening up. Everybody knows you need to wear the mask. You need to wear gloves in some cases. You need to social distance. You need to use hand sanitizer, excuse me. And I'm seeing all these reports and looking online and it's like, and, and you're out in public at the grocery store, people are walking in. What message would you want to convey to folks who are watching this when it comes to states reopening? There's an uptick in the numbers, an obvious uptick. This is the uptick Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks talked about. What would be your message to folks who are watching this right now regarding protocols? I mean, I think it's one of those things that, and as I talked about in the article, that I think too often we're willing to dismiss uh, human nature and mm -hmm. what people do. Mm -hmm. That, again, to, to have hopefully a certain gentleness of approach. And people are... I think pretty universally stressed out from this experience. I think there's some people who feel like, you know, I don't need a scientist telling me what to do. I don't need yeah. the government telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I think to try to be mindful of how fear makes people do things that it doesn't play to their better angels. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard, but, but it's really important. Yeah. Um, to, uh, to help uh, people uh, to act in their own best interests. So it's one of those things that, you know, if you think about how your actions are affecting your loved ones um, and kind of the cost of wearing a mask is pretty small um, and the benefits pretty big. And um, so just try, trying to be people <coughs> of uh, your community and whether it's you know, faith-based or you have a, a spiritual core, otherwise, mm -hmm. that just, you know, trying to take care of each other um, is something most of us, I think, believe in. Yeah. And it's trying to get to that point of just seeing it as, hey, this is a common courtesy. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, pretty important. And it's, it's a small cost. It's yeah. not. So hopefully we can get yeah. to the point that that's where we are. All right, let's talk about these. These are some of the questions that uh, my followers have asked me. So I'm going to ask you, some are embarrassing, but you know what? You're a doctor. <laughs> you're a scientist. So I'm going to throw it on you. I'm going to make sure you're just as embarrassed as I am. Yeah. All right. <laughs> let's talk about um, vaccines. Okay. Some people say that, you know, the vaccines um, are great, love to hear that we're making progress, but they're not going to accept the vaccine. They're not going to take the vaccine because they feel like it's been rushed. And that is uh, coming from the FDA's director of Centers for Biological or for Biologic Evaluation and Research. Uh, they say that 30 to 40% of people say they are not going to take that vaccine. 
What's your response? I think that's why um, having people like Dr. Bright and other experts following a scientific method is so important. Mm -hmm. So it's in the midst of a pandemic to say, you know, we're going to rush this out and this is something we're going to get done and to, you know, to heck with all the safeguards we normally follow. Um, th that gives you pause and that should yeah. make you concerned. But I, I think we're doing a reasonable job of taking it step by step to make sure we're finding an effective vaccine that's safe. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time something is actually available, I, I would feel pretty comfortable with moving ahead and getting the vaccine. Okay. And I think it's one of those things that yeah. I think we've gotten to be so privileged in uh, throughout the United States in our sense of what's a, a risk. Yeah. That, as I think we've talked about in the past, each of my grandparents lost a sibling in childhood mm. to diseases that are, are now completely preventable uh, by vaccines. So yeah. just the idea that um, vaccines have been an extraordinary gift to our health um, in, in the last 80 years mm -hmm. is something that I think we need to be mindful of. Yeah. All right. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. You already know the president touted it as something that you should use. Experts have come out. It's like doctors have come out of their skin. It's like they jumped out like, are you kidding me? Did you say that? The reports about this stuff, uh, which is a medication that's, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, typically used on lupus patients. So talk about the pros and cons of hydroxychloroquine, how we should govern ourselves when it comes to this drug. Well, I think one way of looking at it is if you're taking a, a medication, you want to look at the risks mm -hmm. and then the, the benefits. And if you've got a medication that's very safe, um, doesn't have downsides, is not a direct threat, um, then the question is, well, could it have some effect? And does it have a, a means, what we call a mechanism of action? Does it have a mm -hmm. means of affecting the drug? And in the case of hydroxychloroquine, it, it's a serious medication. It's a dangerous yeah. drug. Only people who are on it typically are, are, they failed other medications that are safer. And so it's getting to the point that you're being very carefully monitored. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that regard, it's not a great medication, even if it were known to be very effective. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the effectiveness side of things, it, it's just, it's got a pretty weak argument for saying this is going to help us out. And yeah. so the combination of those two things um, would argue on the face of it that it's probably not going to be a great medication. And some of the early data coming out, we're still doing trials. Again, there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. Uh, but what we're seeing so far is, you know, not hugely encouraging that it, it's going to be um, something that we should all be thinking about. Okay, um, Dr. Harris, look, I got to keep it real. If I were your daughter or your sister and I said, brother, I'm going to take some hydroxychloroquine because I'm scared of this coronavirus, what would you say? Hell no. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Thank no, you. And, and, I, and I, think, I think a lot of people need to hear that. Yeah. And I, one of the sicker people I've seen was, it's unfortunately a physician who in the uh -huh. early days of the virus um, took a lot of hydroxychloroquine and wow. he died. So he started having the hearty oh rhythms that the medication can cause, never had COVID um, mm. and wasn't at an especially high risk. And so to just, just because we have a pandemic doesn't make common sense, you know, irrelevant anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> common sense ain't common anymore. Yeah. Doc, I have uh, another question for you. This is the one that everybody's been asking me, Monica. Is it safe to have sex during the age of the coronavirus? Doc, don't answer that right now. We're going to take a quick commercial break. See, that's called a tease. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stay with us, folks. Dr. Harris is going to answer that question. Is it safe to have sex during this pandemic? Oh, boy. Stay tuned. The MOJ Show will be right back. <laughs>
Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the MOJ Show. Dr. N. Stewart Harris is still hanging out with us. We're talking about an article that he wrote in the Commonwealth. It's a nonprofit journal of politics, ideas, and civic life. And it's titled, Science Isn't Liberal or Conservative, Red or Blue. Dr. Rick Bright personified that view, and he should be reinstated. And, and basically, Dr. Harris has worked with Dr. Rick Bright. As you know, he was on the uh, Trump administration's team for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. He was fired as a result of coming out um, with his concerns, speaking out about his concerns. So Dr. Harris wrote an article about it and says he should be reinstated. And we dove into um, his experience with Dr. Bright. Uh, and we're also digging into um, the coronavirus and a lot of questions that you have. So before we went to commercial break, I had asked him about vaccines, about protocols and about hydroxychloroquine. But because you guys are so open with me, as I try to be with you, uh, one of the questions that you've been asking, and we laugh, but it's a serious question. Is it safe to have uh, sex during this pandemic? So Dr. Uh, Harris, it's all on you. This is your problem now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that it depends on who you're having sex with so uh, okay. um you can think of it, it just the same way that if you're sequestered and not doing high risk uh interactions mm -hmm. uh, with covid um there's no reason that you know sex should be any more risky than it would normally be mm -hmm. but it, it, you can think of it as uh, kind of along the lines of uh sexually transmitted infection so if you have multiple wow. parts if you're not using uh, protection, if you have people with symptoms, um, you're obviously at much, much higher risk. Uh, what we're finding is we, we've seen kind of conflicting uh, reports about whether uh, the actual virus can be transmitted through semen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an area that you have to imagine that it, it's possible. Um, so whether we ultimately find out that it's definitely possible or, or not, um, the smart thing to do on multiple different levels is you ought to be practicing safe sex. Mm -hmm. um, since it's a respiratory virus, um, some recommendations have come out along the lines of wearing a, a mask yeah. during intercourse. Um, and that's an entirely rational, I think, reasonable thing to have people do. So, Dr. Harris, if you, could, if you could have a conversation with the powers that be, Mm -hmm. um, and and steer this ship in a different direction or the direction of, of what the science is telling us, what the data is telling us. How would you redo the blueprint, so to speak? What would you do? You know, that's it's a, a huge honor and a kind question, Monica. I guess I'd come back, does it, are, are you thinking about response to the pandemic? Or I think, frankly, much more interestingly is how do we address the fundamental inequalities that exist in American medicine and American society? And that was going to be my follow-up question. How would you restructure it? Because obviously there are inequities um, and that's proven with data. And we see it every day on the news. You see it every day in your emergency room uh, with all the patients you treat. You notice the disparities. How would you handle that? I, I think... In some ways, and I'm squelching myself from throwing out a bunch of different ideas, um, but I think it's really important that we take the uh, awareness granted again by George Floyd's death um, to just raise awareness. I think everything has to start with that and not on only a societal level, but just the intensely personal level and going back to our work with kind of ecology and the idea that human health is all part of a much bigger health, um, that without a functioning biosphere, you know, all human health is lost and the intersections of uh, a changing climate mm -hmm. and uh, communities of color and the idea of environmental justice, you know, these are all things that we, we think of healthcare is being, all right, this is healthcare in this box, and this is social justice in this box, and this is uh, kind of criminal reform and policing in this box, and defense is over here, and they're all intertwined. And where I would love for us to go mm -hmm. is to be able to expand the vision of medicine 
um, way beyond what we are now. And it, it's not a power grab, but I think, again, it's the, the airbag is so much better than the need for a trauma center yeah. that in our gunshot violence, in our social violence and our domestic violence, in the incidents of diabetes and hypertension, early strokes, early death. Um, you know, these are all things that the way American medicine is set up right now, um, we just don't have the tools and we're failing, I think, pretty miserably at uh, addressing a lot of these questions. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a huge part of moving beyond that into building better structures is again, it's just personal awareness and professional awareness and responsibility that, you know, this is a, a universal process. This yeah. isn't um, something that, you know, oh, you're, you're a racist and that's, you're mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. I think we have to expand. Go deeper. Into each one of us. Yeah. Every single one of us. That this yeah. isn't a, an outside problem. This is something that's, it's built into the founding documents of the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back to three fifths uh, of uh, a human being. Of a human being. Right. That's what black people have been called uh, in our founding documents three fifths of a human being. Yeah. And so, just to be, I think, just humble and willing to ask each of ourselves, you know, what, how am I contributing to this in a way that I, I'm not even aware of? Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that is something I would uh, really love to see happen. And that's something yeah. I'm definitely struggling with and thinking about um, is how do we get to the point that um, th that racism, rather than being seen as a dismissive um, term, is something that we just we, we come to accept as yeah. a universal human failing where we're not perfect species and we're not um i think as uh don't have as clean hands as each of us would like to would think. like to think doctor on that note i'm gonna have to take another commercial break but i'm gonna i'm gonna start with this question how and what kinds of conversations have you been having with your colleagues i know that uh you shared with me um the uh, experience of um, an African-American woman in your department who has credentials coming out of her ears and she shared something with you that broke your heart. So I want you to talk to our viewers about that. So we're gonna take a quick commercial break, folks. Stay with us, the MLJ Show returns right after this. Everybody. Welcome back to the MOJ Show. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I am so excited to have uh, my very special guest, Dr. Ann Stewart Harris here. Um, he is uh, just phenomenal, a phenomenal doctor who has uh, a bedside manner that I think is super unique. Uh, I don't think he realizes how unique it is because uh, the human side of him shows up in an article that he wrote in the Commonwealth. It's a nonprofit journal of politics, ideas, and civic life. And he wrote the article um, as a result of Dr. Rick Bright being fired from the Trump administration uh, because he uh, sounded the alarm about COVID-19, a lot of his concerns. And Dr. Harris here has worked with Dr. Bright. And he says, basically in his article, not basically, but he comes out and says it, he needs to be reinstated because Dr. Bright was steering the ship in the right direction. And we should have been listening to him more. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Harris is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, chief of division of wilderness medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. So I want to keep reiterating that because I want you guys to know we're talking to a top guy here who's on the front lines of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and um, Dr. Harris, thank you so much for sticking around. I know your schedule is kind of crazy, but I wanted to throw this at you before I get into uh, a deeper question for you. 
this is one of the questions that my uh, one of my followers asked. Is it possible for COVID-19 to be passed on to uh, a pregnant woman's unborn child? Um, again, I'm not an OBGYN, and uh, I think the suspicion, and, and to my knowledge, I, I don't know that we know, mm -hmm. um, the suspicion that it could be passed prior to birth, I think you have to assume it could be. Yeah. Um, I don't know for a fact that it is. Um, because in my mind, and, and I don't mean to cut you off, but in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, probably so. I'm not an expert, but I've heard and I have seen this. A mother who's on crack, her baby is born as a crack addict. So I'm thinking, is that the same sort of thing? Or you're the expert. You tell me. The, the physiology of, uh, of substance use and uh, pregnant women, I think we understand that pretty well. And that's mm -hmm. definitely the case. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. Um, there's just enough uh, that it, that's not what I do. I think mm -hmm. the expectation that as soon as a child is born, since mm -hmm. it's a respiratory virus, mm -hmm. um, so passed typically through breathing, um, that, that we're clearly would be having a child at, at risk of receiving the virus from the air. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's very real. Very real. Okay. Doc, you know, again, we can't separate the two. What's going on with COVID-19 and all the social issues, the racism, the George Floyd incident um, that I don't even have words for it. Um, and I try not to get too emotional about it because it has, I felt like my soul exploded when I saw that video. Um, so I'm sorry, that no. I, I still have it in my head. It's like, you know, I was telling you, we were talking about the mental part of it, how you can't shake it and how a lot of us will be um, forever affected by what we saw. You've had conversations with um, people of color in your department, um, some, eye-opening, some maybe not so eye-opening. Talk about what has been happening in your world in terms of talking about racism, um, realizing what has been happening in this country, understanding that there is a systemic problem in our uh, policing community. And I think in this country overall, there's a systemic problem. And it's one that everybody knows exists talking about racism. Everybody knows it exists. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to face it. But people who are black and brown in this country deal with it every single day. Tell me about some of the conversations you've had and those that have moved you most. I know you talked about one in particular that shook you up. Yes, Monica. It's, um, in, I, I think for, and especially the white members of the audience, and uh, I don't know that there is an awareness that it's a universal problem. And I, and I think that is the problem, mm. that the sense of, uh, received a, a letter from a colleague of, for many, many years, and she's somebody who I admire tremendously, and she's kind of like you, she's just a force of nature, and uh, quick to laugh, and uh, she's the kind of person that is almost seems uh, untouchable. You can't imagine anybody getting to her just because mm -hmm. she is so bright and so um, so very good at her job. Um, but she had a letter that uh, went out to the nursing group and then to the entire ED staff um, that was just heartbreaking. And I, with her permission, shared it with you and was talking to her yesterday mm -hmm. and um just the ways that and again i think in a completely unthinking manner unaware certainly in the vast majority of cases i think without malice or unkindness but just the ways that racism has played out in her life and her mm -hmm. career and mm -hmm. her patient interactions and her interactions with colleagues mm -hmm. um, in an institution that um, is, I think, better than most at addressing mm -hmm. some of these thoughts 
um, with goodwill. And mm -hmm. we've got a heck of a long, long way to go. And we need to yeah. do a lot more listening. But her ability to, uh, to, to, to really ground it in, you know, in her experience was, uh, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, I know it's tough. It's tough. You're, you're battling one pandemic and another one is staring you in the face. You didn't even know it was there for a lot of people. I, I think that's right. And I think it's hard to imagine that the, again, the, the pain of the pandemic and the disruption of the pandemic mm -hmm. has hopefully allowed us to be more aware than we otherwise would have been yeah. um, about Mr. Floyd's death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I hope we can um, get to the point that it just th that awareness is translated into action. Um, I know that's tough when you when you think you're doing a great job and then another problem pops up. You're like, wait, where did this come from? Because that was not my intention. I did not know. And, and that begs the question, Dr. Harrison, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I, I, I've been having very open conversations with my friends and especially with my white friends who have been super supportive. Um, and those who are aware have vocalized to me, hey, I, I did not know. Um, some people are very honest in in their assessment of what's going on and others are not so honest, others have known. Now that you know, now that you are very clear on how racism has plagued uh, this country, in particular in the healthcare system and COVID-19 made it very clear that it is true. How and what do you think you can do to change it? Because one of the slogans that has been going around social media is silence is violence. A lot of celebrities have put together um, videos. A lot of uh, sports figures have done the same thing. NASCAR has, you know, banned the uh, Confederate flag. A lot of people doesn't don't know how very deeply disrespectful that is to Black and Brown people in this country. How very hurtful it is. So now that you know, what is it that you plan to do? How do you think you can govern yourself better to address the issue and 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 speak on it when you see it happening? I, I think part of it is exactly that. Speak on it when you see it happen is certainly, but I think the, the move towards uh, anti-racism to just assume that there's racism inherent in a circumstance. And if you're not mm -hmm. kind of thinking about it actively, mm -hmm. then um, you're probably more complicit than you're aware. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's the continued awareness, I think is pretty that's without the awareness i think we're just we're throwing platitudes and you know trying to make other people uh the demons or the people who are in the wrong where it's like if you're not willing to say you know we exist in a system that has been uh thoughtfully designed over more than a couple of centuries yeah. uh to have certain people more valued than others um and if you're not acting in that in your day-to-day -day human interactions, um, and then on a wider policy level, mm -hmm. um, you're probably not moving things forward. Yeah. Doc, I got to take another commercial break. Stay with me. I have uh, uh, an excerpt, another excerpt from your article um, that just stilled me. It, it shook me to my core because it was as if you were foretelling. So folks, stay with us. Dr. Harris is going to stick around here. It's the MOJ Show. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome back to the MOJ Show, talking to Dr. N. Stewart Harris. He is the fanciest doctor I've ever talked to. <laughs> I've said his title a million times. You guys know by now. But uh, we've had a very interesting conversation uh, during the MOJ Show, talking about COVID-19, all the elements that are associated with it, in, including uh, 
racism, including these social injustices that are not um, just uh, what we've seen during the protests as a result of the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, um, but also in our healthcare system. Uh, we're finding and we're seeing, I'm sure everybody is by now, it's a systemic problem. And Dr. Harris is on the front lines of that. He sees it every day, in particular, as a result of the pandemic. So we've been having a very open, honest discussion about um, COVID-19 and racism in this country in an article that he wrote regarding the uh, termination of Dr. Rick Bright, who was on the uh, Trump administration's team uh, steering the ship um, with this COVID-19. And when he spoke out, he was fired because he spoke the truth. And a lot of people did not want to hear it, unfortunately. And uh, Dr. Bright uh, has not returned. Dr. Harris here says in this article, he needs to be reinstated right now. 25 years plus experience speaking. So I believe what he says and I, and I hope we, can do better moving forward. But Dr. Harris, before we uh, went to commercial break, um, you hit upon a couple things, but there are a couple other things that you wanted our viewers to know, our followers to know about. Talk about those things for me with regard to uh, the healthcare system, this pandemic and everything else that we discussed. Thank you, Monica. I, and again, I hugely appreciate the opportunity to, to, to speak with you and to speak Thank with you. uh, your listeners. Uh, and one thing that, <laughs> I want us to be aware of it is just a significant part of my career and of, again, keeping people well is mm -hmm. so much more important uh, than treating them once they're sick yeah. and how humans interact with their environment. And that can be other humans that can be with industrial or, or residential pollution. It can be uh, through all kinds of different ways it is something that communities of color are already preferentially much more impacted uh, than other populations. And so that, as people who are interested in their own health and in seeking change, um, is something that we need to make sure that communities of color are fully aware of the dangers that they face um, from environmental change mm -hmm. and how ways that that can, uh, by addressing environmental concerns, can improve uh, human health. Yeah, yeah. Very well said, my friend. Thank you so much. And again, in your article um, called Science Isn't Liberal or Conservative, Red or Blue, uh, Dr. Rick Bright personified that view should be reinstated. Love this article. One of the things you said here in this article, doctor, um, and again, it was like you were foretelling. So I want to read this to our uh, viewers. You say, I'm a Southerner come north to Boston, a man most at home in rural central Virginia come to a busy urban emergency department. You go on to say, I share the sense of a country divided against itself, even as I cherish aspects of both red and blue state America. I increasingly see little difference between them other than a mutual and stubborn unwillingness to extend a charitable view to the other, to recognize and start to overcome the durable divides dating back to our country's founding. That one hit me uh, particularly hard because of what happened with George Floyd. Um, and the words you used, a mutual and stubborn unwillingness to extend a charitable view. You could not have known what was coming, but you saw the video just like the rest of us did of the murder of George Floyd. I don't think you could have written this any better. I'm here with you, Monica. You know, it's, it's very difficult to navigate um, through the process of getting the information out there to people. 
uh, making sure that they understand the urgency of what is happening in our country. And as I was reading um, these words, I just thought, oh my God, what a perfect description of what is happening and what has happened in our country. Um, you could not have known that that George Floyd video, that incident was going to happen. But this, this sentence, this paragraph says it all. How do we move forward? How, how, do, we, how do we make this better? Because I find myself looking for answers. I'm a journalist, I'm curious, I ask questions. You summed it up in just a few words here, the entirety of, of the situation in our country right now. How do we fix it? The divides, the stubbornness, the unwillingness, uh, I am certainly not uh, any kind of an expert in any of this. So this is just my my personal, what I've learned uh, from mentors and friends like uh, Jim McPherson. So in part of my lost youth, I studied fiction for a couple of years and uh, I was in a seminar with uh, Jim McPherson in 1992 when uh, Rodney King in the response to that nationwide. And for those of your viewers who don't know him, uh, Jim is an extraordinary writer, uh, was the first black author to win the Pulitzer for fiction, was a mm. the initial class of MacArthur Genius Grant winners. Um, was a fellow Southerner and um, just the blessing of... Uh, I know that's tough, he's passed on, he was your friend. He was a dear friend. Yeah. But yeah. he writes about in, in the preface to a book of short stories, uh, Breeze Pancake, about the hope with which he returned to the University of Virginia around 1976 and mm -hmm. his feeling as a black man who had been educated through college in the South, um, had fled North to Harvard Med School, uh, I mean to Harvard Law School, um, and then had gone to uh, Iowa to the same program I was in. Um, just his sense of wanting to return, wanting to see coldness um, in returning to his home South. Um, and it worked out poorly, and he spent the rest of his life in Iowa, um, which for me was an extraordinary blessing, and I met my wife there. Um, so I'm eternally grateful. But yeah. just the conversations we were having in 1970, uh, 1992, um, are, are ones that are, are completely, we're revisiting them now, and we've mm -hmm. revisited them. And I think if we can try to get beyond pointing fingers and see this again. And I think that was the extraordinary genius of Reverend King. Dr. King was that, that sense of uh, a shared both history and mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. that um, it, it's just so critical. I think it's so easy and it's even more so sides and to throw bombs back and forth at each other but yeah. for us as uh, Americans to get to the point that we recognize um, that fear can be on both sides of the fence that mm -hmm. goodwill can be on both sides of the fence yeah and that trying to uh, move ahead together it, it's just so critical and I, I just I shudder to think that we will return to um, kind of the just bitter fighting and pointing rather than recognizing again how universal this problem is and yeah. how um, I, I don't want people to be driven in, into their their kind of areas of fear. Fear makes mm -hmm. humans do things that we just, it's not who they are and it's not who they want to be. And it's hard to recover from it. 
Well, it's it's so yeah. hard, and then we're just we lose another twenty years, and, mm-hmm. and then we're back again, and and we think of it as being surprising. Yeah, um, it's a it's a cycle that just keeps repeating itself. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know, and I I think again, it's it's incumbent upon especially people of extraordinary privilege like mine to to Mm -hmm. step back and to say, you know, I don't think I'm a racist, but if you say that you're already, I mean, just by existing in this world, Mm -hmm. um, you're benefiting. And and it may not again be through thoughts of your own or through actions, but your lack of reaction to that and lack of willingness to address it and to consider and to think about wait a second, how, how can things be different? How can I approach the world differently? Um, is, I think that has to be the solution. I don't yeah. think it's, um, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, go, no, I was just going to say, it's basically reevaluating, reevaluating how you're going to live your life moving forward now that you know, because as Oprah says, now that you know, you will be held accountable. And I mean that in a spiritual sense, accountability uh, means something in this world and in the afterlife, which whatever afterlife you believe in, you know, now that you know, what will you do? How will you help? And I think that's really important. It's a really important question for all of us to ask ourselves. Dr. Harris, uh, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. And uh, again, uh, this article is moving, it's riveting. Uh, Folks, if you uh, get a chance, um, it is uh, in the Commonwealth. It's a nonprofit journal of politics, ideas, and civic life. And uh, Dr. Harris wrote this uh, article after the termination of Dr. Uh, Rick Bright from the uh, Trump administration as they were steering the ship, so to speak, on COVID-19. He was fired, as you, a lot of you know, um, because he spoke out, he sounded an alarm, and uh, he has not been reinstated. Dr. Harris here believes that he should be. So thank you for sharing your views in this article. Thank you for talking to me and to our audience about COVID-19, how it plays into these social issues, what you've seen in your emergency room and how um, we got to make a change. Everybody, collectively, we got to make a change. We got to get better. So my friend, thank you once again. Uh, Please be safe. Monica, I hugely appreciate the opportunity and I wish your listeners the very, very best. All right, folks, that'll do it for the MOJ Show. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I hope you guys got a lot out of this uh, interview, just as I have uh, a lot of information. And I'll continue to talk to people like uh, Dr. Harris because they're experts in their field. They're bringing us uh, information that we otherwise would not get. And, you know, I'm going to continue to promote our slogan. We don't just talk, we do. So I hope this has helped you as much as it has helped me. So once again, do what you can, do what you should. And remember, the MOJ Show is right there with you. We are doing well by doing good. Take care.